Good afternoon, everyone. It's Professor Shields. And we're moving on to lecture number two, which is the availability of water. And taking a look at our objectives today, you'll see that you have a lot of calculations. And the reason why is we're going to do a large amount of upfront information that will help us calculate flow in lecture number three using two different methods. So first, what we're going to calculate is a water budget. Then we're going to talk about delineating a watershed. And this is actually homework number one. Then we'll move on to identifying precipitation characteristics. We'll calculate a unit hydrograph and then be able to project it into something larger than a one unit or an inch hydrograph. And then finally, we're going to calculate rainfall intensity. And what we're going to do is bring all of these elements together next week, as I said, to calculate flow. Now, the first part of our discussion with the water budget is understanding the hydrological cycle. And this you probably have seen many times, especially in grammar school and high school, and if you took earth science. And the purpose of the hydrologic cycle is to look at, essentially, the water budget. How does, the, how does water move throughout the, the earth? And there really is no one starting point. Many times we often start at the top, where we look at um, cloud formation. And then we look at precipitation, typically in the form of rain, sleet, snow, hail. You might be seeing that some this week. Then once the precipitation hits Earth, we often say that it is runoff or snow melt as it moves down from a higher elevation to a lower elevation. Now, if some water, some of the precipitation may not be runoff. It may infiltrate into the soil, depending on the type of soil. And it can, will continue to move from there, known as groundwater. And that groundwater will often move towards a larger body of water at a lower elevation, such as an ocean, a lake, or a river. If you, you can end up in a freshwater storage, such as a lake, you can end up in a saltwater storage, such as an ocean. And often we say that the cycle moves up again, where you'll have some evaporation due to the sun from the heat. There's also evapotranspiration, which this also includes the release of water from plants. We go back to the cycle again, where the precipitation starts, the water starts to condense, and essentially we start the cycle again. Now, the three, one bit of four main characteristics that we look at from a civil engineering standpoint, the first is R, which is known as runoff, I, which is infiltration, E, which is evapotranspiration, and then we consider any change in storage. So notice typically when you're looking at the total precipitation, it's the sum of rainfall, I'm sorry, runoff, infiltration, evapotranspiration, and minus any storage that isn't moving through the system. It's staying simply in one place. Now, one thing I do recommend, if you have a moment, go to this YouTube video and watch, and this is an actual animation of the water cycle. And again, it just gives you a better sense of how water moves throughout the Earth. Now, what I'd like to do is do an example where we calculate the water budget. And typically, what will be interesting is we will often use the units acre feet, as you can see at the bottom. And this is a little bit of an odd unit, and it's technically considered a volume, because the acre is a square, square footage area, and feet is the height. So that will give us a volume. So the first question that we're going to do, and what I'll do is I recommend I will set up the question, and then I recommend you pause the video and see if you can solve for each piece as we go. So that way you can see if you're following along. So the question asks, in the mid-Atlantic region of the United States, a meteorological station records the following readings in one year. A meteorological station is essentially a gauge station that's in a permanent or fixed location. So it has a latitude and a longitude, and typically an elevation as well. So there's, a more, there's more precise information about the location and the information that's being collected. Now, the information that was collected at the station was that the annual precipitation was 45 inches, the infiltration into the soil is 10 inches, the evapotranspiration back into the atmosphere is 24 inches, 
and the change in storage is zero inches. So essentially, this was not a water body. And we're asked to calculate the annual runoff in acre feet if the watershed, meaning that the area that we're considering here is one square mile. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to write down the water budget equation, which is precipitation is equal to runoff plus infiltration plus evapotranspiration minus the change in storage. What I'm going to do is rearrange the equation since we're interested specifically in runoff so that the runoff is equal to precipitation minus infiltration minus evapotranspiration plus the change in storage. Now looking at the information given, we notice that there's no change in storage. So if you like, you can take that out immediately. So take a moment if you need to pause the video and just calculate what the total runoff in inches is. So the runoff is equal to 45 inches minus 10 inches minus 24 inches. And that's equal to 11 inches. So it's assumed, based on this calculation, that there's 11 inches of runoff that will move from a higher elevation to a lower elevation inside of the watershed. But again, the question asks for an acre feet, which is a very typical unit in an applied hydraulic. So let me work with you to do this. So 11 inches. We're going to use a little bit of dimensional analysis, very similar to what we would use in flow mechanics. First, I want to, I want to uh, convert into 11, 11 inches into feet. So there's one foot and 12 inches. I'm going to work through as much of this so you can see the conversion. There will be some conversions that I'm not expecting you to know, and I'm presenting them here so that you can use them in the future. So this is approximately 0.197 feet. But again, this is just the depth of the runoff, we have to take into account the area, which is one square mile, and convert that into acres. So we're going to multiply this by one mile squared. Now the conversion that I'm not expecting you to have, but I'm giving to you for your use, one acre is equal to zero point zero zero one five six miles square. Make that look a little bit more like a square. So that way our miles square cancel. If you take a minute to just run the calculation, give you a second to do that. you should get a total of 587, actually I'll round to the nearest whole number, 588 acre feet. So that's a, that is the volume of flow that we're looking at for this watershed. So now that we've had, we performed a calculation of the water budget, now we're going to talk a little bit more about this term called a watershed, because I just, I just announced it and I didn't really discuss it in too much depth. So what is a watershed? A watershed is what we call a basic hydrological unit, and this is for managing water resources. Essentially, if you want to think about it, think about it as a large bowl. And in that large bowl or tub, this is where you store your water. And you want to know what the volume of water inside that tub is. So that is way you can plan your resources. You can know how much water is available for drinking, for industrial or commercial uses. 
and how do you delineate it? Now, here's an example of the New York City water supply system. We actually have three watersheds. The first, if you could see my pointer, this is the Croton system. This is one of the first systems that we had. The second and third, they actually look like they're one large one, are the Delaware and the Catskill. So the Delaware and the Catskill are part of this large watershed area here. And as you can see, we have a series of pipelines, which we'll talk about later when we discuss drinking water, that travel and bring and deliver water to the five boroughs. So this is our drinking water supply. Now, it's very important to determine what is the area of this watershed so that we know the volume of water as part of the storage. So how do you calculate that area or delineate a watershed? First, you have to identify what we call a point of interest. So for example, if you move over to the right and you see my pointer, the point of the lowest elevation of the watershed is typically what we call the point of interest, as you can see me pointing here. We'd say the point of interest is up here for the Delaware and the Croton watersheds, because that's when we're delivering it by gravity. Then what we're going to do is we're going to highlight contributing streams and waterways. So again, as you can see up in the Delaware and the Catskill, here I'm circling some of the contributing streams and waterways that empty into this watershed. And there's one down here as well. Let's go higher reservoir. In the Croton, there's a series of smaller streams and rivers that empty into the watershed as well. Then in step three, you start to develop contour lines. I'm sorry, you cross contour lines at a perpendicular angle. And I'll show you as an example in the, in the next slide how you go about doing that. And again, if you need to repeat this and go back to this piece, Please do so that you can do it for your homework. So moving on to the next slide, just to show you how this works. Keep in mind that a watershed may, its high and low points, shall we say, the high points, high elevations and low elevations, may not always go from top to bottom. So you always want to be careful of that. So following the three steps that we just spoke about, so here we have an area, topographic map, and this is what you will start with for homework. It's a very, topo uh, very basic topographic map. You will be told the point of interest. So in this particular example, the point of interest is this small waterway, this small lake here, in which all of the flow will be moving into at high, from higher elevations. So first you identify your point of interest. For the homework, you'll be told it. Then what you do is you highlight any streams that would empty into that waterway. So again, notice I, the direction I, walk, I, I moved in. And this may include some additional lakes to your system. So here, this is a very simplistic watershed. There's just one stream and one contributing lake. And all of the movement, and I'll change my color just to make it a little bit easier to see, the assumption is, is that all of the movement of the precipitation will move in the direction of the point of interest. So how do you delineate the area that is the watershed? Now, this is not one of the steps, but it's something that I find particularly helpful when I actually delineate a watershed. I like to highlight high points, so areas of high elevation. I highlight for myself. And the reason why I do that is so that it almost makes me think of the rim of the bowl, the top of the rim, and then I can picture all of the flow moving from the top of the rim down into the bottom of the bowl, which would be your point of interest. For step number three, now this is the step that takes the most amount of time, and what I'll do is I'll show it as an example, erase the whole slide, and do it again, so that way you can see it. So what we're doing next is we're starting to delineate the watershed area. You always start at the point of interest. Now you can move to the left or to the right, it doesn't matter. But you want to go to the next contour line and you want to hit it perpendicularly as best as you can. And then you move to the next contour line and the next and the next. And notice how you, you may see that there is a 
Let me get out my pointer to show you here. Typically where you see a dip in the contour line meeting you as you move along the way, that's usually a hint of a low, of a low, I'm sorry, a high point, excuse me, and a dividing point between one side of the watershed and another watershed. So again, continuing on, we're trying to hit it perpendicularly. And typically you hit one of your high points that you've outlined, perpendicular, hit my other high point. I might have done this a little bit different than the other, than how we're shown here. And since I hit this strange plateau that's up here, how you decide to go across this plateau up here is up to you. Now, one thing that's obviously missing from this diagram are the actual elevations identified on the topographic map. So it'll make it a lot easier when you're looking at your topographic map and you can see actual elevation numbers. So continuing on again, how you interpret it, everyone has a slightly different interpretation. Maybe I would have come around this way, then into here, then hit this perpendicularly. And they've went this way. And there's some judgment and everybody will end up with a slightly different answer. So we all should be approximately within the same range. So now what we would do is now that you've found, you've delineated the area, your goal, and you can use any method you wish, is to determine the area of this irregular shape. You could take uh, graph paper or engineering paper and overlay it and count the boxes. You could scale it off. You could make a series of estimated shapes and size. But again, your goal is to find out what is this area in acres. Now again, this looks a little messy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase the page. And I'll show you the delineation again. So again, step one, identify your point of interest. Step two, identify any contributing streams. And some of your streams may contain additional water bodies, and that's okay. Now, it could have been that there were additional streams that went off from that lake, and that's okay. You would include those as well. After you've identified all of your contributing water bodies, then you would start delineating your watershed. I'm going to start in the opposite direction. And again, I may have started slightly different than how it's shown here. Again, it's open to interpretation. If you'd like, you could also do the additional step of identifying high points, but again, that's your choice. Notice that I'm trying to hit all of the contour lines on a perpendicular, to the best of my ability, I should say. And how you decide to do that and they cause you have a slightly different interpretation. Once you've mo moved in a circle and you've come back around to your point of interest, you've delineated your watershed, and then using your choice of method, you're going to estimate the area. There also are computer programs online that can help you find the area. These are known as planimeters. You can look that up if you wish. Those are tools specifically for this purpose. And that would be the area of your watershed. Now, again, go back to this as many times as you need for the homework. And please feel free to come to me if you have any questions. Now, what I'd like to move to next is starting to look at some of the characteristics of precipitation. Now, precipitation, depending on where you are geographically, Obviously, the amount of precipitation and how heavily precipitation falls and over the period of time changes. So some of the things that we're going to consider, now the main body is the U.S. National Weather Service, and many of you have probably an app on your phone from the National Weather Service. Um, again, their information typically goes to the Weather Channel, and you probably use their data all of the time to find out if there's going to be a snow day, should you bring an umbrella, this is the data that they collect. They collect a series of inter information about precipitation, particularly what is the total depth of precipitation, say, over the storm. Is it a matter of inches 
or do they, they also calculate the annual precipitation? And this is particularly important for very dry areas, such as the Midwest, where they only see, say, 7 to 10 inches of precipitation a year, and they need to, to properly plan and utilize that water. Another part that's of interest with the data is the duration. How long do we see precipitation for? Storms that act over multiple days, such as nor'easters that we will see, tend to be problematic because they tend to saturate the ground and then we have additional runoff and flooding. Another term is intensity, and we'll talk a little bit about different types of um, intensities and where they are throughout the country. And this is typically given in inches per hour. So many times you'll see from a weather forecast that they're expecting two inches of snow in an hour or one inch of rain in an hour, which is a tremendous amount of rain in an hour. Another piece of information that's more for engineers and scientists for planning purposes is the return interval. We've heard of the 100-year storm and the 500-year storm, and we'll talk about other different types of storms for design purposes. Rainfall distribution type looks at all of these different types of characteristics above. So the image that you see over to the right, this is an example of annual precipitation per year. So here in New York City, we tend to see approximately 48 inches of precipitation. Typically, we say that in rain, not snow, 48 inches of rain a year, where if we look down south, say in Florida, particularly where they'll see um, numerous tropical storms, they go as high as 64 inches per year. Now we've talked about storm frequency, and we've done this before in fluid mechanics, but I'm giving it to you here just to show you the formula because we'll look at different storm frequencies in just a moment. Again, remember what the definition of a storm frequency is. It's the measure of the probability that the storm will occur in any given year. And that's important because many people misunderstand it. When they say it's a 100-year storm, they think, oh, there's only a chance it will happen once in 100 years. And that's not so. What that means is there's a chance that it will happen at 1% any given year. And that's a significant amount of risk when we look at it. So just as the example below, this is the calculation for the 100-year storm. So just as an example, we could use this for any type of storm interval that we're looking for. And remember, the main uh, storm frequency goes under this different, different terms. It's called the recurrence interval, the return interval, um, the storm event. So again, just keep in mind that it has multiple names. So again, just as an example, the 100-year storm, if you want to find the return frequency for the 100-year storm, it's 1 divided by 100, or 0.1, or 0 .01, which is 1%. So again, there's a 1% chance any given year. Now, why is this important for engineers? Well, we base our codes on different types of return intervals. Again, you've seen the 100-year storm because I spoke about it in fluid mechanics with relation to bridge design. So again, notice the 100-year storm is often used for high traffic bridge design. It's also used for large or more important culvert, culverts, ones that will have high traffic. So if many people will be affected by the failure of that bridge, it's given a higher priority with the 100-year storm. And typically, dams have a 1 in 500-year return interval, again, because of the importance of the dam and typically if the dam should fail, the water, the water resource that is lost and possibly the people that would be affected downstream would be very significant. Now, up two other types of return intervals that we haven't seen very often are the 10 and the 50 year storm. And these are typically for smaller, low traffic structures. So again, you may be designing for the 10 or the 50 year storm professionally if you can have, again, a low traffic situation. Now, another rainfall characteristic that we're going to look at is what we call rainfall distribution. And this will be particularly useful when we talk about what we call the TR55 method. Next lecture for lecture number three, 
we're going to focus on two different types of flow calculations for watershed. One is called the rational method, and the other is called the TR55. And again, this is under the urban hydrology for small watersheds. And this was developed by the National Resources Conservation Service. And this group is a, is a federal agency. It's also very useful from a soil mechanics perspective, because they also collected multiple uh, samples of data of the different types of soils throughout the United States so that we can determine the type of infiltration. So taking a look, there are three different types of rainfall distribution that we characterize in the United States and Puerto Rico. Type 1 and type A means least intense, meaning it tends to be um, for shorter durations and not for long periods of time. And again, this would be more in the Pacific area, as well as in Alaska, for obvious reasons, much of the precipitation is snow. Type 2 means that over 90% of the rainfall occurs in the middle 12 hours. So again, you see the largest amount of rainfall in the middle of the storm, and it's not incredibly intense. And this is characterized by most of the interior of the United States. Now, keep in mind, in particular for us, type 3, this is where we typically see tropical storm and nor'easter type of rainfall. We have very, very heavy precipitation in a matter of hours. And this could continue for multiple hours. So the Gulf and Atlantic states. So typically when we see, again, areas such as, and our, here's our type 3s, you see you have part of the lower United States, including Texas, Mississippi, and New Orleans, um, Louisiana, excuse me, which would make sense given the type of precipitation seen for Hurricane Katrina. Southern Florida, the southeastern coastal states, where we often see many of the tropical storms go, and the northeastern area of the United States, which includes New York City, and just keep that in mind, where we often see our northeasters, and if a tropical storm which or hurricane should make its way up to us, that's the type of rainfall we see. Now, another type of um, rainfall characteristic that we look at is we try to organize a lot of the rainfall information into what we call a hydrograph. And I'll show an example in just a second. It's essentially a plot of, I I could draw this for you very basically. Give me a second. If you were to plot precipitation versus time, which is typically in hours, often you'll see that the precipitation will start off, it'll hit a peak, and then the storm will start to pass. Many times what we'll do is we'll estimate this, this shape into a triangle. Now the bottom half, again, that I did not include, is known as the base flow. And this is the typical precipitation that you, I'm sorry, the typical flow that you may see in a waterway, in a river. But the additional, which is the green triangle, is the additional flow volume that you'll see during a storm. So again, a hydrograph predicts a runoff or flow from a storm as a function of time. And again, the volume of the runoff can be calculated as the area under the curve. Now, you could use an estimating method if you had an actual function. Oftentimes, it's not a very unique function, so you would use um, more of an estimating method or a numerical method to calculate the area under this curve. But oftentimes, it's a very good estimate to simply assume that it's a triangle, in which case the area under the triangle is one half the base times the height. So again, as you can see, one half the flow or the precipitation times the time divided by two. And we'll do an example of that as our next problem. This new term called the unit hydrograph, this is a tool to bring it down to a, to account for a one inch of precipitation. Now, you could also say one centimeter of precipitation, but typically in the United States, we use one inch as our standard. 
So what we will do is we'll create a unit hydrograph for one inch so that if we find out later that there was a storm event that created two, three, or four inches of precipitation, all you have to do is simply multiply by the number of precipitation. So again, that's why we call it a unit hydrograph. We're just making a base of one so that we can multiply by whatever amount of precipitation we find. And then you could look at it in this way. This is the more general formula if you wanted to find the average volume. This is the area divided by the, the excess precipitation. Again, the excess precipitation is the green. So again, if you wanted to find, if you did not want to estimate by using a triangle, this is more the, this is more the, the numerical way of going about finding the volume under the curve. But again, we're going to focus on just using the estimation method, which is a triangle. So now moving along to example number two, here's an example of a hydrograph. Again, we're assuming it to be more triangular in shape. As you can see, the base flow is assumed to be 50 cubic feet per second in the river. And the additional flow that we see from the peak here was due to the storm. And at different times, again, the more precise hours that the gauge took the reading are listed in the chart. So at 12.7 hours, 14, 15.4, 6, and 16.5 hours during the storm, the gauge read different amounts of flow. So again, our problem says a watershed has an area of half a square mile. To find the unit hydrograph using the sample hydrograph given. Then to find the hydrograph for the two-inch storm. Now just to give you an understanding of what the chart is saying, again, down at the bottom. First, you see this one piece saying 1.8 inches of runoff. What does that mean? What I'm going to do is show you where that number came from first. Then we'll include our information there. The second one is the unit hydrograph values. So again, this is for one inch. So again, what we're going to do is scale the 1.18 inches, which is shown here, and we're going to scale it down to one inch. Then what we're being asked to do is to scale it up to a two inch storm. So say later down the road, or perhaps for planning purposes, they want to know what the flows are for a two inch storm. So again, you can scale up or down once you have a one inch hydrograph. So again, we'll write it down here just so that we remember that this is the hydrograph. Oh, let me grab a different color here so it's easier to see. So this is the actual hydrograph column, specifically the unit hydrograph. So first I want to prove where the 1.18 inches came from. So let me do that. So in order to do that, I will get a new page. And again, you can follow along, or if you wish, or if you want to stop and do different pieces at a time, you may. What I'm going to do is I will periodically pause the recording and give you different chunks at a time so that it's a little bit faster for you to go through. So again, working with the first piece. So how do you calculate the area under the curve? We said that the area under the curve is essentially a triangle, so one half the change in time times the change in flow. Now going back to our previous slide, and again I apologize for going back and forth, the change in time, again more precisely you see it goes from 12.7 to 16.5. Since I'm estimating, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say between hour 13 and hour 17. So there's a change in time of four hours. And then also I need the change in flow. Essentially, I'm moving from a base flow of 50 to a maximum flow of 250. So that's essentially the height of my triangle is 250 minus 50. So using using those variables, 
I have one half times a four hour change of time times a flow of 200 cubic feet per second. Now what I'm going to do is I'll need to do some conversions here. Now, I'll also need, I think it'll be easier if I change hours into seconds. I'm going to give you, just so you know, I'm going to put it directly in here. Let's see if we can do this. Perhaps it's easier if I just say option five. Four hours is equal to 144,000 seconds. So that way my four hours is immediately converted and that way I have a total volume of 1,404,000 cubic feet. And that's my total volume, but again, I want to figure out what is the depth of the precipitation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert that. Now remember that volume is equal to area times height or depth. And I'm interested in what is the height of the precipitation. How many inches is that overall. So rearranging my equation, I get depth is equal to volume divided by area. I have H is equal to 1,440,000 cubic feet. Now one thing I converted off to the side, and again, you can do this if you'd like, a half of a square mile is equal to 1.39 times 10 to the 7 cubic feet. And honestly, I just went on and I used Google and I did the conversion. And you're totally welcome to do that, especially if you are trying to do some additional calculations. And it would help if you show these calculations off to the side or as part of your calculations for your homework. And the reason why is you're going to use many different types of units, and your choice of how you prefer to, to convert them is completely up to you. As long as you show me where your work is coming from, I have no problem with that. Again, just getting that number in. I let's correct that over here. This is a square mile. Otherwise, my units won't work. And when you calculate that out, you should end up with approximately 0 0.1 feet. And when you convert 0 0.1 feet into inches, you get approximately 1.2. And this is where they did the calculation more precisely for the hours. They got 1.18 for the example problem in your textbook. So I just want to show you where that's coming from. So first, this is where the 1.18 is coming from. So moving back, so again, this is where the first column of figuring out, well, what is the depth of precipitation for the average for this flow? Now what we're going to do, since we've just proven that, now I'm just going to write in very quickly what the runoff was for each of these times. So we have 50, 155, and I'm just reading the data off the chart that's up to the top right. 250, 137, and 50. So again, I'm just taking this information. This is the last point at 16.5 hours, you had a flow of 50 cubic feet per second. 
Now what I'd like to do is I'll go through one example of converting it down or scaling it down to one inch. And then what I would suggest to you is to pause the recording and at least try one more ratio and see if you get the answer. And then what I'll do is come back to this main slide and I'll give you all of the remaining answers. I'm going to my blank page. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate what the scale would be for the first point. So again, if it helps for, let's say for our first one, for a time of 12.7 hours and a 1.18 inches of precipitation, we had 50 feet CFS. So for one inch, how does that translate into the amount of CFS? So this is just a basic ratio problem. So again, you have, you could do this ratio however you wish. One inch is to 1.18 inches as X CFS is to 50 CFS. If you want to pause, Calculate the ratio yourself very quickly. You should end up with an X of 42.37 CFS. Take a minute and let's go back to the example. Again, we said that the flow is 42.37. So I'll write this then. Try one of the next ones. So say, try an example ratio for the time of 14 hours at 1.18 inches for 155 CFS how does that scale for one inch at X CFS? And I'll give you a moment to pause the recording. And then when I come back, what I'll do is I'll give you the remaining solution. So hopefully you've tried the next one. And you should have gotten a solution of approximately 131.36. And the next would have been 211.86, the next 116.10, and then finally again 42.37, since it's the same as the first. Just to show it to you again, we're going to follow the same exact ratio procedure for the two inch. So I'll show one more example and then give you the remaining solution. My apologies, my phone is going off here. So let me add, we have our calculation page here. Let me add a secondary page. So say let's try, and I'll say this is calculation B, for at time 12.7. And we had 1.18 inches for 50 CFS. What would the flow be for 2 inches? Now, clearly here you could see that we're simply doubling the 1 inch. So if you want, you could do the ratio. Or, going back to our slide here, You could simply double all of these numbers because, again, remember, the scale factor between 1 and 2 inches is simply 2. But again, I'll do the calculation just to show it to you, but essentially all you're doing is doubling the 1 inch to go to the 2 inch. So again, very quickly, we have 2 inches 
negative to 1.18 as x is to 50 via that. In which case you should find very quickly that x is 84.8. CFS. So going back to our table, now I'm just going to quickly label in all of the, the double precipitation deaths. So 84.74, 262, 0.72, 4.23, 0.72, 232, 0.20, and again I'm just doubling the first value again, 84.74. And again, these would be the values of the flow of the precipitation, I'm sorry, at our two inch storm. Again, overall, over the course of the storm, it's essentially for that area there's two inches of precipitation over that four hour period. And these would be the flows at different intervals. So again, at the very beginning of the storm, you'd expect 84.7 CFS. At the peak of the storm, you would see over 400 CFS. And again, this helps in the planning. So again, after the unit hydrograph, another term that I'd like to look at with you is called intensity duration and frequency. What this looks at is three different aspects or characteristics of precipitation events. We talked about this before in our previous slide and we talked about what each of the three are. So again, going through real quick, intensity would be a precipitation per time, so again, typically in inches per hour. Duration meaning over how many hours is this storm existing. And then frequency meaning is this a 100 year storm, a 50 year storm, or a 500 year storm. Typically, and again, you've been given examples of intensity, duration, IDF curves. So again, if I go back to your previous slide on precipitation, this is an example of an IDF curve. And the reason why is it's telling you what the precipitation, um, excuse me, this is uh, not an, an idea of curve, this is an example of precipitation. But similar to this, the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has, has samples of this. And if you go to your, um, to your Blackboard account, I have a file called Hydro 35. And there's maps there of IDF curves. So you can take a look at those. And you will be using that for your next homework assignment. Now the problem is sometimes not always IDF curves are available. It might be a remote location or they simply do not have data for that area. So often engineers will make curves. Again, they'll try to interpolate between different geographic areas just so that you can find out what type of intensity for a storm you'll experience. So again, this formula here is completely empirical. Again, that means that the units have to be given in the specific, um, in specific different types of units. The units will cancel out, and they don't make physical sense. Again, it's based off of a relationship that was developed as part of research. So if you want to find the intensity in inches per hour, there are three constants. So if you do not have a curve or a map available to you, you can estimate the intensity using a constant in inches per hour, a secondary constant in minutes, and C is the third uh, dimensionless constant, which is used for the exponential. Again, it depends on where you are geographically. I'll do an example so that this makes a little more sense. Oh, oh, I apologize. I didn't realize I had this on the next slide for you. So this is an example of an IDF curve. And as you can see, this is made by NOAA, again, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration National Weather Service. And again, this was published in 1977, and again, it's still used today. Oftentimes, we will make some increases to it based on some of our concerns with climate change. So sometimes we'll increase this, these inches uh, amounts by, say, 5 to 10%. 
So this is an example of an IDF curve. So as you can see here in New York City, in this area, it's difficult to read, but it's pr I think we're looking at about seven and a half inches of this curve. Again, you have this file on, in Blackboard in lecture number two as a larger PDF file. So you can go in and zoom into it and find exactly what you need. And then these curves will give you er areas of isohydal type of precipitation, which means that they assume that they have equal precipitation depth in these areas. And then you interpolate in between two of the isohydal lines. And again, we'll do more of that next week when we actually start estimating the, in, uh, the intensity for a storm. But what I would like to do with you is just to show you an example of a synthetic IDF so that you can calculate it if need be. So here's an example. So again, using table 1.6 that's found in your textbook, it says calculate the intensity for a 10-year. So again, it has a frequency of 10 years. It has a duration of one hour. And they're asking you to find what is the intensity in inches per hour. And this is for Denver, Colorado. So just to make it a little bit easier, I'm going to highlight under Denver, Colorado. And we'll use those values to calculate our idea. So again, the formula, and again, completely empirical, is the intensity is equal to a constant A divided by T plus B raised to the C. And again, we want to make sure that we have the correct units. So we have I is equal to our constant A is 50.8 inches per hour. But I would drop the unit simply because it's empirical. Our time is one hour. But again, remember, we want the, the time to be in minutes. So again, make sure you put that as 60 minutes. plus our constant B, which is 10.5. And the last constant C is raised to the 0 0.84. Again, I'll give you a moment if you'd like to pause to calculate it. If you have had a moment to calculate it, you should get an intensity equal to 1.42 inches per hour. This is rather low for a very intense storm, but it makes sense given that we're in Colorado. So now, let's take a look. We've accomplished all of our objectives for today. I know you're very excited. So first notice that we calculated a water budget. We found out what the total runoff was. Second, we delineated a watershed and found what we could do to find the total area of a watershed based on a point of interest. Then we, did, we identified different precipitation characteristics, such as intensity, frequency, duration. And we've also looked at the term called the unit hydrograph. And we calculated both a unit hydrograph and then scaled it up to a two-inch hydrograph. And then finally, we calculated rainfall intensity using a synthetic IDF curve. And for next class, we'll look at tables and charts that tell us the value directly. Phew. OK. So what is left for you to do? I hope you enjoyed my little graphic here. Again, please make sure you do quiz number one by the due date. Again, this is typically by Friday evening. Second, make sure you begin homework number one. This is just the draft stage. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to develop your own um, delineation of your watershed and upload it as a draft by the due date. So that way I can comment on it, give you any suggestions, and then you can finalize it the next week. 
I thank you all very much for your time. And again, please see me if you have any questions about this lecture or using Blackboard Collaborate. Thank you very much.